Hello, I'm Andy Agathangelo, the founder of the Transparency Task Force. Uh, the Transparency Task Force is a certified social enterprise, which means that we exist to make an impact and not to make a profit. Our mission is to promote ongoing reform of the financial sector so that it serves society better. And we go about this work in many different ways. Uh, one of the ways being as per today's event to bring people to together to discuss particular issues of real concern. Now, I have to say that this topic we're discussing today, the revolving door topic, is a problem of enormous significance. It's an issue that we believe has a, uh, has a, a casts a long shadow over many aspects of the financial services sector, and indeed not just the financial services sector, but also other industries as well. And I'm therefore particularly pleased that we've been able to assemble a tremendous lineup of speakers uh, to discuss these issues, uh, not just in terms of explaining what the problem is, but also in terms of actually looking at potential solutions to the problem too. I'm going to start off with a short video in a moment. It's a video on YouTube. I'll put a, click, uh, a link into the uh, chat in a moment so you can all access the video later if you want to. It's a video interview of uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren, who is uh, talking about the revolving door problem in the context of Goldman Sachs in, a, in the USA. And I'm going to show that because it does such a great job of highlighting uh, the tremendous problem that is wrapped up within the revolving door issue, a topic we talk about so often, but this is the very first time that we've decided to actually uh, dedicate an event to it. So before I go to the, uh, the video of Senator Warren, I'll just deal with a couple of housekeeping points. Uh, we are recording the session, and as soon as the editing is finished, we'll get it out there. And we'd be grateful if you were to help raise awareness of it through social media. Uh, please also feel free to make good use of the chat box so that you can record your comments, questions, and ideas uh, as we go through the event as well. Obviously keep everything polite and civilized. However strong your feelings are, always remain polite and civilized and constructive. And um, I think that pretty much sets the scene uh, nicely from my point of view. So I'm now going to uh, share my screen and I'm going to show you this uh, video. It's only about three minutes long, but it really does, I think, a particularly good job of showing just how egregious the revolving door problem can be talked about a bill that you're talking about correcting some corrupt corruption that's going on yep. right now does that include changing you're talking a lot about change changing the system that will not allow this kind of executive branch to do the kinds of things they're doing at this point one of the things this bill does is it it blocks the revolving door between wall street and washington and let me just tell all of you a quick story here you may remember that as a candidate Donald talked a lot about Goldman Sachs, right? Oh, terrible, Goldman Sachs. He then got elected and hired enough Goldman Sachs bankers to open a branch office of Goldman Sachs in the White House, right? <laughs> Woo. Okay, but one of the people he hired is really special. His name is Gary Cohn. And he was a big deal official at Goldman Sachs, came over to the White House, and here's the deal. On his way out the door from Goldman Sachs, Goldman Sachs gave him a little parting gift. Gold watch, party balloons, cake, no, oh, quarter of a billion dollars. Yeah, because they knew what Gary's job was gonna be. It was gonna be exactly one thing, to muscle through a new tax law that would affect Goldman Sachs. So they give him, on the way out the door, a quarter of a billion dollars as a party gift. I like to think of it as a pre-bribe. <laughs> so he can go off and write the tax laws, which, by the way, shows you how smart Goldman Sachs is. Now, this is the deal. The revolving door between Washington and Wall Street, how do you know who those guys are working for? 
is that guy working for Goldman Sachs or is he working for the American public? My view is if you want to come work for the American public, you got to work for the American public. But you don't get to do this running through the revolving door. Lobbyists shouldn't be hired in our government, right? Stop them. So there's a piece of what we would change of what's going on right now. I'll give you one more. And that is, you shouldn't be able, when you are, oh, let's just say like President of the United States, to be able to run a business on the side. <laughs> so people who have business with the United States government go take a suite of rooms in order to line whose pocket on this. It's fundamentally wrong. You want to be a public servant, then you got to get rid of the side businesses. You don't get to own individual stocks. That's over. Either you're in public service or you're on the private side, but nobody in America should be guessing who you actually work for. That's what this is about. So there's examples, two examples. Hope that's helpful. I really do think that that um, is a particularly strong um, example of the kind of issues that can, can come to the surface as a direct consequence of the revolving door problem. Within the Transparency Task Force, as many of you will know, we have, I'm very sad to say, become increasingly concerned about the effectiveness of the regulatory framework within the financial services sector. I'm sure that there are issues in other industries as well, but we really have become very, very concerned about the effectiveness of the regulatory framework within the financial services sector. And, and we've come to those views for good reason. We've come to those views of concern because of all the evidence we've seen, evidence that adds up to, quite frankly, catastrophic regulatory failure. And many of our members are individuals who have become victims of financial crime, victims of scams, victims of all kinds of malpractice, malfeasance, misconduct and mis-selling. And not in every case, but in most cases, there is a degree of regulatory failure involved. I'm sorry to say this, but it is true. It is what the evidence is showing us. And very, very often that regulatory failure, we wonder, may in part be attributable to the revolving door problem. And in a moment, Mark Bishop, who is going to be our first main speaker, will be sharing his insights and his thoughts around some of these issues. But I just want to give you all a feel for the scale of the problem. I'm going to share my screen again, and I'm going to show you something which I think some of you have seen before. Uh, what you're looking at now, ladies and gentlemen, is a table of the amount of fines that the different industries have incurred since the year 2010 in the UK. And you'll see in the last place, the good place, the least fined industry is paints and coatings. In 45th place, there is to apparel, then tobacco in 44th, in 43rd, there is medical equipment and supplies. And I personally believe there is very good reason to expect that the financial services industry, an industry which has to be trusted to function successfully, should be at this good end of the table. It shouldn't be anywhere near the top. However, as you will see, I'm very sad and disappointed to say that the financial industry in the UK is fined more than any other sector. There we have it, financial services. Since the year 2010, the financial services sector in the UK has been fined just under five billion pounds sterling. That's an enormous figure. To put it into context, if you add up all of the other industries together, so numbers two through to 46 added up, they all equate roughly to the same as the financial services sector. 
So this really does suggest that there is something particularly problematic with the conduct of the financial industry. It does seem as though the financial sector has some very bad habits. Let me put it that way. And if you click on the financial services sector, you get shown the worst 10 offenders. NatWest is at the top there, then Barclays, then Lloyds, et cetera, et cetera. And if you scroll down the table, you have a list of all the individual infringements. And what you see is a pattern. The same organizations are doing the same things wrong over and over again. And the word for this is recidivism. Recidivism is the characteristic of individuals and organizations who are caught doing wrong, who are prosecuted and penalized, who are basically uh, uh, free to carry on doing what they do. We believe one of the reasons why these organizations carry on harming society, carrying on breaking the rules and breaking the laws, is because there is a complete lack of personal jeopardy for the individuals. And this is a particular problem because Mark Carney, the former governor of the Bank of England, he said quite famously after the global financial crisis that the single biggest reason there was such a big crisis is because there was a lack of personal accountability. That resulted in the UK regulator developing the senior managers certification regime, a regime designed to drive personal accountability into the system. But the reality is that those powers have hardly ever been used at all, if ever, to prosecute senior people doing harm to society. And that really does make you wonder why. And our suspicion is that we have a regulatory framework that to one degree or another is captured. And one of the reasons why we have a regulatory framework that is to one degree or another captured is because of the revolving door problem. Individuals who leave a, a job in the regulatory environment who then go and become senior executives at a bank, for example, or senior individuals from a regulated, from a private company who then take on a very senior role in government or in the regulatory framework. We think of the revolving door problem as an apex issue. It is a top priority issue. It manifests into many other uh, problems that are very, very difficult to deal with. And our purpose today, ladies and gentlemen, is to collectively discuss these issues, to shine a big bright light on them, and in the knowledge that sunlight really is the best disinfectant. I hope that sets the scene nicely. We have some lovely, lovely speakers today. We'll get to their introductions uh, as we go. But first of all, we're going to ask Mark Bishop, who, as many of you will know, is a major contributor to the Transparency Task Force's efforts. Uh, and Mark is going to talk about this in more detail and perhaps may cite one or two examples to refer to. So can we please, uh, first of all, show our appreciation to Mark for presenting his session. Thank you very much indeed, Mark. And over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Andy. I'm going to share screen. OK, so here we go. Um, I should say by way of background, I've been a financial services campaigner for around uh, 10 years now. Uh, because I was one of the victims of the Connaught Income Fund Series 1. Um, and when I began to investigate with a few of my uh, fellow investors what had happened in that case, uh, it became very clear to us, firstly, that, um, that there had been misconduct, secondly, that uh, the regulator was not particularly interested in it, and thirdly, that the regulator had known about the misconduct for a very long time and chosen to do nothing about it. So uh, this was a point that I became aware of regulatory failure, um, perhaps regulatory capture, as well. Um, and uh, as I tried to uh, campaign to get justice for those people, myself included, um, I started to notice that there were all sorts of unusual conflicts of interest appearing amongst the people who should be trying to help, uh, many of whom were not in fact really helping us. So um, I'm going to kind of go through some of those almost in chronological order, if I may. So, so here we are. 
uh, with the first slide. I should say that the examples I'm going to give you are mostly about public appointments. And the reason I've chosen to do it that way uh, is because I think there's a different dynamic with, um, with those from uh, the public sector into the private. But I will talk about what those are toward the end. At the moment, I'm mostly concerned with the individuals who are working in public appointments because they have statutory duties or they have a reasonable expectation from us as citizens about what they're going to do. So very early on as a campaigner, in this case for Cornwall victims, um, I noticed something, in fact, I was tipped off uh, by an MP about something strange, which is uh, employees of the Financial Conduct Authority being seconded into the office of the Economic Secretary to the Treasury who, as most of you know, is the, the minister who is most closely responsible for uh, the uh, Financial Conduct Authority. Um, and I'd been warned that there were two people who were performing the role of private secretary to the, uh, the then uh, Economic Secretary of the Treasury, who were from the FCA. Uh, and this is obviously a concern because these people are responsible for all of the incoming correspondence to the minister. And there is a risk that they could filter damaging information, meaning information that might damage the, um, the minister's view of the FCA, and could even give their own employer, the FCA, a heads up about some of those complaints. Um, there is, of course, also a potential for such people to brief the FCA stroke city line. And I will tell you um, between us that um, subsequently, a person I know who knows socially somebody who was an economic secretary of the Treasury during matters to do with Connaught and made public statements about the case has told my friend that they would have said things other than they did in their public statements if they had known the full story. They only got the FCA's version of events because it's filtered and they get to put their spin on it. <clears throat> and the next one is um, MPs office staff being recruited by the FCA's Public Affairs Division. So there was an MP who was very helpful to us, and that MP had office staff who were also extremely helpful. One individual particularly was exceptionally capable in my view, and that person told me that they had been approached by the FCA's Public Affairs Department uh, to go and work there, a salary of course much higher than they would get in their current role. Uh, and the phrase that was used by the person trying to hire them was, we want to hear of MPs' problems before MPs do, which basically means that this person was supposed to establish relationships with people who work in MPs' offices in Westminster, find out about casework that was coming in, in which the FCA could be criticised and tip them off first. It seems to me that that was an inducement to, in effect, uh, ask public servants not to serve the public, um, to keep information from those we elect. Of course, this uh, had higher gone ahead. It would also have presented an, presented an incentive to existing MPs' employees. You know, if you are helpful to the FCA, the FCA may be helpful to your career. Another one that I saw that concerned me deeply was the appointment of John Griffith Jones to be the chair of the FSA stroke FCA. I think he was there either side of the transition. Um, he was heavily criticised for taking the role at uh, the time because he had been the overall boss of KPMG, a uh, firm that had been responsible for many defective audits, particularly those of banks that failed in the global financial crisis, HBOS and RBS. Um, would it be dif difficult or impossible for the regulator to go after those deficiently audited firms, I suspect it might, would certainly have been difficult to have opened the questions about the, the merger between HBOS and Lloyds or the RBS rights issue. Many of um, the shareholders in those organisations believe that uh, those uh, corporate actions were essentially fraudulent. Um, also, there were many audit scandals affecting listed firms and KPMG had more than its share of criticism for those. And it would not be unreasonable to speculate about whether the FCA's ultimate kind of overseer of listed markets ought to be looking into those. Uh, but of course, be careful what, for what you wish for, because when John Griffith Jones stepped down, he was replaced by Charles Randall. Unfortunately, not an improvement. Um, he'd been a partner at Slaughter and May, who was seconded to Her Majesty's Treasury uh, when the banks collapsed. So he was intimately involved in the bank rescues. And if you believe, as many of us do, 
that things were done to rescue and recapitalize the banks that were certainly unethical and probably illegal. Um, you might not look first to the FCA, chaired by the man who led those bank rescues, um, to remedy those situations. Um, and of course, there were many other clients in the financial sector uh, that his firm represented over the years. So more conflicts of interest. A few more examples uh, with Connaught. Eventually, we got partial redress as a result of kind of bullying the FCA, and, if you like, blackmailing it. Um, and part of that, or when that, when that happened, we were told there would be an independent review. Uh, and this independent review was commissioned by the FCA from a gentleman by the name of Raj Parker. And Parker had been for 30 odd years um, employed by Freshfields, the Magic Circle law firm. For I think 23 of them, he'd been a partner there. Um, and he'd worked with a lot of interesting people, including two individuals uh, that had subsequently become senior executives at the Financial Conduct Authority. And at least one of those individuals, Norska Delfast, there may have been others, at least one of those individuals uh, was a person who was intimately involved in the failures and some people would say cover-ups that led to Connaught being where it was. Um, so in no sense was he independent. Um, his review found that although mistakes were made, they were all made in, in good faith. Uh, there was no evidence of bad faith. Had there been evidence of bad faith, we would have had a very strong case um, for suing the FCA or its officers for compensation and quite possibly getting them sent to prison for misconduct in public office. Uh, six months after the report was published, the FCA hired him as a senior legal advisor, a nice little part-time sinecure as he moves uh, toward the twilight of his career. I submitted a freedom of information request and found out that the job was never advertised, never briefed out to search consultants, and uh, no other candidates were considered for the role, even informally. Does it feel like a payoff? Well, the FCA argues otherwise, but you know you can make up your own view. Of course, uh, so subsequently, not long after, uh, Nikhil Rati became the chief executive of the FCA. Um, he has a very colourful career. Um, he was a, a bright young thing at the uh, Her Majesty's Treasury during the era of, and I quote, not just light touch regulation, but minimal touch regulation. Um, when that kind of behaviour um, led to uh, things getting a bit um, uncomfortable, he moved on to become a private secretary to first Blair and then Brown uh, during the era of, of, and I quote again, open door, uh, an open door at number 10 for bankers. Uh, and of course, when that behaviour led to the whole thing uh, going belly up, uh, he became director of financial services group at Her Majesty's Treasury, uh, trying to solve the mess that uh, his kind of thinking and this kind of revolving door creates. Um, but of course, he is not alone. His predecessor has been on a very similar kind of journey. Uh, Andrew Bailey uh, started off in the special operations. Well, he didn't start off, but he, he became a person of interest uh, when he was appointed to the Special Operations Unit of the Bank of England, which is really a euphemism for the part of the Bank of England that was dealing with trying to unpick uh, the mess that was caused in the global financial crisis. Uh, from that, he evolved to become the Chief Executive of the FCA. Uh, and you'd have to ask yourself, in that role, uh, would it have been difficult for him to have unpicked some of the decisions that were taken to rescue the banks, some of the ways in which the banks chose to recapitalize themselves? I think probably the answer is yes. And he's now, of course, the governor of the Bank of England. Now, Dominic Cummings is a name that uh, polarizes opinion. I think probably he's managed to alienate, alienate both sides of the political spectrum. But I um, screen grabbed this little exchange. Um, you might re remember that uh, when the uh, Bank of England announced a base rate rise last week, um, our capable friend, Mr. Bailey, uh, made some kind of tinnied statement to the effect that uh, individuals, workers should not demand big pay rises, despite the fact that inflation was going up and their mortgages were about to go up. Um, and he was criticised for that. Um, and Cummings has said, Bailey was another super duff appointment. I tried to kibosh and failed. You know, whatever you think of Cummings, you know, he kind of positioned himself as being the outsider's outsider, trying to fix the cosy cartels that happen in the British establishment. Um, and one of those is this revolving door, whereby people of low capability and even lower integrity uh, find themselves revolving onward and upward uh, into roles in which they are ever more conflicted. 
Oops. Okay, so a few more real life examples. If you're going to talk about um, Andrew Bailey, you have to talk about his mini me, um, Megan Butler. Uh, Megan was a founding employee of the Financial Services Authority. I think she joined in the year 2000 or 2001 before it even acquired its powers. It was being built up. Uh, when uh, Martin Wheatley became chief executive of the Financial Conduct Authority, you know, the replacement regulator in theory, uh, I think probably many people believe he genuinely wanted to do a good job and to fix the place. And, you know, some people found that life got a bit uncomfortable. Um, and so it's interesting that um, Megan Butler followed uh, Andrew Bailey to the Bank of England. Um, and when he returned uh, to the Financial Conduct Authority, so did she. Um, there are rumours and you know, I cannot confirm or cannot prove that these rumours are true, but quite well sourced rumours that uh, it was the intention of all concerned that Butler would have replaced Bailey as the chief executive of the FCA when he went off to the Bank of Eng England as governor. Uh, and this would have happened were it not for that pesky Dame Elizabeth Gloucester insisting on naming all of the accountable executives uh, at board level uh, and um, executive committee level and above, um, because in naming uh, Butler, he made she made it impractical or not politically palatable for Butler to get the top job. job. So instead, she was made exec director of transformation by Nicola Rati. Uh, and I suppose his view was that this would go fantastically and she could get all of the credit for that turnaround. He could then go back to a thank you job in the private sector and she would take over at the FCA. You know, thanks to a few uh, campaigners, um, maybe bringing to attention of the uh, Treasury Committee you know, the inappropriate nature of her appointment and the fact that it was made as usual without any kind of attempt to get external candidates, only one internal candidate, um, that uh, position became untenable and now she's announced that she's going to go. So uh, that actually is a, a little glimmer of hope. It is worth our while campaigning on these things because sometimes you get a win. Uh, here's one where so far we haven't had a win. Norsa Cadelfas. Uh, she is the interim chief executive and chief ombudsman at the Financial Ombudsman Service. I mentioned her in the context of Connaught. And the reason is that uh, back in the days, the early days of the FCA, and just before it became the FCA, when it was still the FSA, she led what was known as the Complex Events Team. And that's really a euphemism for the FCA's clear up squad. Uh, this was a team that got involved in cases where there'd been regulatory failure or where the regulator was constrained to act because of political sensitivity. So the interest rate hedging um, uh, product redress scheme that has been uh, criticised by SWIFT was also something on which Norsic Delfas and her team were absolutely 100% front and centre in charge of the thing. And they are referenced multiple times in the SWIFT report. Um, so when it all got a little bit hot at uh, the FCA, she was seconded into the Ombudsman as interim chief executive. Uh, I have a fear that this puts her in pole position for a permanent role. I've tried corresponding with Baroness Manzor, who is the uh, chair of the organization. She refuses to engage with me, uh, but one of her minions has basically said um, that Delfas is not going anywhere. Uh, now, just as uh, Megan Butler is the mini me of um, Andrew Bailey, so Simone Ferreira is the mini me of Norsica Delfas. Uh, Simone, Simone Ferreira was the right hand woman of, um, of Delfas at the complex events team. Uh, you might remember her name because there was a certain amount of uh, negative publicity about her a few, few years ago when it emerged that she had been partying with RBS bosses while also overseeing the section 166 uh, report into the RBS GRG division. I think they were um, kind of singing uh, karaoke and so on and get extremely drunk. Um, so uh, you have to ask the question again, is there a subversion of acceptable recruitment policies going on here? And probably more important question is, why is it happening? Um, and if you like that one, you're going to like this one. The amazing case of Richard Lloyd. Uh, Richard Lloyd is, um, was a special advisor to Gordon Brown in 2008 to 10. And you'd have to speculate that he must have worked with both um, Rathi, Rathi and Randall uh, on the bank rescues, given the timing and the role that he was in. He then kind of moved into private sector for a while, uh, kind of to clean up his reputation, if you like, if you're really cynical, uh, by becoming an executive director, which, and then the chairman of an organization called Resolver, 
uh, which interestingly was kind of handling uh, complaints for the financial ombudsman service. It contracted out uh, some complaint handling uh, to Resolver. Um, so you might think that this might have made him less than independent uh, when the uh, FOS decided that it needed to have an independent review into its own performance. And you'll recall that happened in 2018 because there had been whistleblowers talking about how the FOS just kind of made up decisions. It had a bias in favour of uh, big firms because big firms would challenge decisions um, and consumers would be less likely to do so. Uh, they didn't have the training or the expertise needed to do their jobs. So um, he kind of carried out this review and this review was largely a whitewash. You know, as we've known since because of the resignation of Callan Wayman, that organization was not even slightly fit for purpose and uh, he failed to call it out. Um, but amazingly, in the year after his non-independent independent review stroke whitewash was published, he became a non-executive director of the FCA. He became the interim chair and then the chair of the body that deals with MPs expenses and he got an OBE. Remarkable. What's the chance of that happening? Eh? Um, and uh, we now learn, uh, 2022, that he is to be the interim chair of the FCA uh, while it looks for a permanent replacement for Charles Randall. I'm just speculating here, but I kind of think that this puts him in pole position to do the job on a permanent basis. So here is an entertaining exchange from Twitter. Um, if you look first at Richard Lloyd's tweet, not my retweet of it, Basically, the background to this tweet is that uh, a number of uh, people campaigning uh, for consumers and small businesses to be better treated by the regulator uh, locked up outside the FCA's offices in Stratford, and they were there with their banners protesting and all the rest of it, um, and uh, Andrew Bailey invited them in for a coffee. So Richard Lloyd says, few if any CEOs join a protest outside their office and invite protesters in for tea, as Andrew Bailey did today. I hope people who routinely aim personal abuse at one of the most thoughtful, straight and honourable regulators I've known will think again. So he was literally defending the regulator against consumer campaigners. And remember, it's not just any regulator. This is Bailey we're talking about. So I tweeted out, Richard is an independent non-exec appointed to the FCA board to represent consumer interests. He got the job after writing the whitewash report, largely exonerating the financial, financial ombudsman of Channel 4 dispatches allegations. He's the Shami Chakrabarti of financial services regulation. For those of you who don't recall Shami Chakrabarti, um, she, she's now a baroness, um, an event that is entirely unconnected uh, with her decision to write a report uh, into whether allegations of anti-Semitism in the Labour Party were, were justified or not and found that they largely were unjustified. Um, so uh, kind of uh, you've got to ask a question about uh, this appointment. Uh, really, what does it mean? Um, and there is a background to it. Uh, and I have to say, uh, and it's probably a phrase I've used a couple of times before, we campaigners should be very careful what we wish for. Uh, because you'll recall that last year when it was announced that Charles Randall was to step down, um, we created a, an open letter. Several hundred people signed it, including me, um, and it basically said, you know, you can't just have another city insider become the new chair of the F FCA. You need somebody who will be mindful of consumer interests. So uh, and we actually used the phrase, it should be a very different kind of chair. Now, when I look at what's happened, I actually think it's like they're trolling us. You know, we've said we want a consumer person to be the, um, to be the chair, so they've given us Richard Lloyd who claims to be a consumer representative. Um, you know, you might not say that he's actually done anything to help consumers, and certainly that little Twitter exchange there would suggest quite the reverse. Um, so you've got to then think, well, what else is he? If he's not a consumer representative, is he another member of the club? The club is a phrase I've used very often. It's basically the people who held senior positions in the banks, the auditors, the law firms, uh, the Treasury, the Bank of England, and the regulator, when the global financial crisis hit. They were the people who basically had to work together in order to save the banks. If you believe that things were done that were Ill illegal or immoral during that time, and that the members of the club are all looking out for each other, because if one of them gets kind of taken down for what they did, they all get taken down for what they did, then you could see that Richard Lloyd, far from being a consumer representative, is actually on the side of the club. He's a member of the club because of where he was during that period. A couple more examples that you'll like. 
uh, the Treasury Committee. Now, this is a difficult one because, of course, you know, a person from any background can become an MP. We accept that. And there should be diversity of backgrounds within Parliament. Um, and once somebody becomes an MP, they can become a minister, including one in the Treasury. But it's interesting, isn't it, that the person who chairs the Treasury Committee, Mel Stride, used to be a Treasury Minister. Harriet Baldwin, who's on it, used to be an Economic Secretary to the Treasury. Um, Anthony Brown, who is a member of it, used to be the Chief Executive of the British Bankers Association, the BBA, an organisation whose reputation became so closely involved with kind of the illegalities of LIBOR manipulation that it actually had to be abolished. And the BBA was merged into other organisations to create what's now UK finance. I've also found at least one example in the past of an FCA employee being seconded to the Secretariat of the Treasury Committee, another obvious conflict of interest. And then there is the Financial Regulators Complaints Commissioner. The current commissioner is a lady by the name of Amadeep Samal. Uh, she used to be the independent assessor of the financial ombudsman. Basically, she was supposed to look at the performance of the ombudsman from a consumer perspective, deal with any complaints about it. But she largely kind of, you know, her position was nothing to see here, move along. So, you know, some people would ask, was she really on consumer side? Is this current job a bit of a, a thank you for having kept, you know, the lid on what was going on at the Ombudsman, uh, much, most of which has now come to light. Um, she also has an extremely colourful backstory. I'm not going to talk personally about the things that she's done, but I would say if you just uh, Google her name and Raoul Moat, uh, and particularly look at the, the Mail Online story, you will see what I mean. Um, I think it's probably unlikely that she would be successful in returning to uh, a, a, an opportunity to practice the law. Um, and I think that outside of financial services, it would be a struggle for her to gain any other public appointment. So as a result of those things, she desperately needs this job. And there is at least one other former FCA employee on the payroll. Uh, I haven't had time to talk about the, the FCA's consumer panel, but you've got to bear in mind that this is a panel uh, of people who supposedly represent consumers. Uh, that is appointed actually by the people that they should be keeping an eye on, the FCA. Um, the current oh, outgoing chair, I don't think, has made a single public pronouncement in her life in favour of consumers in financial services before she came became the leader of that panel. So in what sense was she a consumer representative? Uh, over the years, there have been many people on that panel who have very obvious conflicts of interest, including one guy who was the in-house lawyer for Fred the Shred, so that guy is at least a witness if he's not a suspect. Um, a former economic secretary to the Treasury, one who got kicked out of public life because of her behaviour in the expenses scandal. Uh, and a woman whose kind of side um, hustle was writing research notes sponsored by firms about their products in financial services. One of the products that she wrote a glowing report about was key data, which turned out to be one of the uh, biggest financial services forwards of the 2000s. Um, there are many HMT stroke FCA moves uh, into the industry, and I have, a, have deliberately chosen not to speak in detail about those because when once they're in the industry, their ability to do us harm is much reduced. But that doesn't mean that this isn't a very bad thing. If we look, for example, recently, Catherine Braddock, who was kind of doing the job that um, Nikhil Rata used to be doing, the top kind of boss of the financial services division of the um, of HM Treasury, has moved to a top job at Barclays. And the uh, the, the conflicts people, you know, at COA or whatever they're called, uh, decided that this appointment was acceptable because she hadn't had significant dealings with Barclays in her role. And I'm sure that that's true. But that's not the issue. That is absolutely a misunderstanding of why these appointments are bad. The reason why they are harmful is that whoever replaces Catherine Braddock and all of the people around them and their counterparts in, for example, the FCA, the Bank of England, the PRA, all of those people will realise that there is the potential to get an exceptionally well-paid job with a bank if you do the things that banks like. And there is no potential to get such a role if you do things that harm or upset banks. So you kind of create this economic incentive for self-policing, if you like. So that's the next slide. Here we are. So, you know, this presentation isn't just about what the problem is, it's supposed to be about how to solve it. And I think very often when you have a problem, you're trying to work out how to fix it, you've got to really try and define it. 
And in trying to define this, I'll use a tool from operations management called Five Whys. The idea is to make out you're a six-year-old child, and whenever you're given an answer, just reply why and try and get to the bottom of it. If you do that about five times, you usually get to the underlying problem. So why are all these conflicted hires going on? I believe it's because they are desperate to prevent honest politicians and the public from realizing the full truth. So next why is, why don't they want the truth to come out? Well, there's at least three reasons. The first is they bent and broke the law to save the banks. The second is the FCA has a huge liability because it's been unfit for purpose for years. If you accepted that it was as flawed as it is, you'd have to repay all of its victims for the past 15 years or whatever. And the third reason, as far as the junior people is concerned, is money. If you behave in the way that banks and the industry generally want, you might get a job with them bank paying a lot more. Um, third, why is this? Uh, why don't they fess up and ask for forgiveness? Quite simple. They think they'll go to prison or at least they'll have their careers ruined. Next why is, why would they change that position? So one reason could be that the net is closing in. Another is that if they were offered a clearly communicated and very palatable olive branch, they might actually realize that coming over to our side might, side might not be the end of the world. That leads to the kind of fifth why, which is why might the status quo change? One option is that campaigners might acquire some leverage they didn't have before. The SWIFT report is significant, could lead to a judicial review, police investigation, private prosecutions, because what it shows beyond doubt is that the regulator failed to do the things that it should have done, an enforcement investigation, proper redress scheme. Connors is significant, there may well be prosecutions in terms of what the regulators did there, an almighty cover up. Um, there could be further independent reviews in many other cases, and of course, um, Transparency Task Force is providing the Secretariat to the APPG on Personal Banking and Fairer Financial Services, which is uh, carrying out its call for evidence about the FCA. And I can tell you some of the things that we found in that will make your hair curl. Uh, so kind of moving toward a, a conclusion, really, I'm advocating here a three pronged approach. You know, the three kind of prongs are shine a light, guerrilla war and olive branch. So the first is shining a light, identify and call out insider hires and conflicts of interest. Bring them to the attention of honest politicians and the media. The reason why we talk to the media is that they will amplify it as a message to honest politicians. Propose constructive and reasonable solutions. You know, we should always be there to say, this is a problem, this is how it can be solved. Don't just criticize. Um, guerrilla war, focus on the underlying reason for the revolving door, which is the misconduct that they are trying to cover up. Um, deal with that by means of public exposure, judicial review, police investigation, private criminal prosecution for individual bad actors. And then the third part, which is actually in a way the most important, and that's the olive branch. Keep communication, channel, communication channels open with them. Offer constructive suggestions and help at every stage. Apply for roles, including in public bodies, and complain when you are rejected in favour of patches. And make it clear our victory is inevitable because the longer they keep digging, the bigger the hole they will find themselves in when they realize that they've run out of energy. And they will eventually, they can't keep playing this game. Okay, so that's me done. Uh, I don't know if you want any questions or comments now, or if we go into the next uh, presentation. Uh, Mark, thank you very, very much indeed. That, that was a remarkably clear and very compelling presentation as always. You do such a wonderful job, Mark, of setting the scene for our sessions. You really, really do. We're going to go to Jeff Hauser shortly, but just in case anybody has anything they'd like to say at this point, please uh, wave your hand at me if you'd like to comment or ask a question following on from Mark's session just now. It looks like we're good, in which case, can we please show our appreciation to Mark? Thank you again, Mark, very, very much indeed. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Very, very good indeed. And let's go straight to Jeff Hauser. Jeff, please they do take the opportunity to introduce yourself and your organisation, an organisation that is as relevant to this event as it possibly, possibly could be. Jeff, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Andy. Um, yes, my name is Jeff Hauser. I am the executive director of the Revolving Door Project. In fact, our website is the revolvingdoorproject.org. Um, and this is what we work on. Um, and there are a ton of resonances between the critiques we have of the revolving door in the United States and the presentation from Mark uh, focusing on the United Kingdom. 
um, a brief history of how the problem has progressed in the United States and what we and countless allies are trying to do about it. From the Jimmy Carter years in the 1970s, there became a bipartisan consensus in the United States that government was part of the problem and a devaluation of public service. And this has had a long-term impact on the ability of the government to actually solve problems. The more people don't believe in government, eventually it's gonna start being true that government can't help. And arguably that is the mess the United States is in on even the pandemic at this very moment. Um, so there are two separate trends to keep in mind. One is the background of people who receive political appointments in the United States. And then the second is how do career people in government what is their attitude and what, how long do they stay in government? Are career jobs in the US government actually career length or are they, as Mark was discussing, a lot of people who are looking to make a lucrative exit from public service into the private sector, into influence peddling? And so we think about this from two different lenses primarily. Uh, one is Wall Street in the financial sector. And the second is what we call big law. So. Fresh fields uh, in the UK and firms like that. We have a whole host of American-based firms, and obviously there's overlap, consulting and lobbying industries. What are the issues? There are obvious conflicts of interest. There is cultural capture, both of the senior leadership at a moment and the long-term impact on career people at an independent agency when their bosses are constantly veterans of the industry that they're supposed to be regulating. And then there is, again, the post-government future, the lucrative uh, exit plan that so many people are dreaming of. During the Reagan years, the attack on government accelerated drastically. Uh, what, what had begun under Carter got much worse, and the prestige of working in government went down. When Bill Clinton took office, he not only empowered Goldman Sachs alumni like Robert Rubin, he bragged on it. It was a, a point of pride that the Democratic Party could hire people from Goldman Sachs because Goldman Sachs was seen as having smarter, more prestigious people. And so if you could bring in prestigious people, that was obviously supposed to be a good thing. And that continued the erosion of Franklin Delano Roosevelt's New Deal era uh, um, ethos within the Democratic Party. Robert Rubin was a master network builder. He was a kind, tireless mentor who connected his favored people to each other and to as many outside groups as possible. And so Robert Rubin led a friendly, amiable takeover of economic policymaking within the Democratic Party. And that continued during George W. Bush's uh, shambolic uh, presidency. On the outside, Robert Rubin continued to uh, mentor people and help them rise up and build a government in waiting and then Barack Obama became president amidst the ongoing fallout of the Great Recession and financial crisis. But rather than turn to the people who had been skeptical of deregulation and the practices that led to the financial crisis, he brought back in a team of Robert Rubin's protégés. In fact, the official who helped build out Barack Obama's economic policy team was a man by the name of Michael Froman, on the one hand, you can think of him as somebody who went to law school with Barack Obama, so that was fortuitous, but he was also a protege of Robert Rubin who had followed Robert Rubin from the Clinton administration over to uh, Citigroup, uh, a failing bank. They built a team that was very Wall Street friendly. Uh, individuals like Mary Shapiro and Mary Jo White ran the SEC. Um, the continued aversion to enforcing American antitrust laws uh, that had uh, accelerated under George W. Bush continued uh, at both the Federal Trade Commission and the Justice Department's antitrust division. Um, but there began to be a backlash. For the first time since the Democratic Party joined the Republican Party uh, in becoming essentially anti-government, and in bringing in people from the business sector uh, to run things and encouraging staff to uh, revolve out into big law and viewing it as harmless, 
Elizabeth Warren led a counter movement within the Democratic Party. Uh, there was a big moment in 2014 when she led a group to block uh, Lazard uh, banker Antonio Weiss, a mergers and acquisition expert from a nomination for the number three position at the American Treasury uh, focused on the bond market, and a market in which he actually had no experience. He was a mergers and acquisitions figure, but it was viewed by the establishment within the Democratic Party that anyone who had worked for a prominent financial services firm obviously understood all you needed to know about economics. Um, and in fact, you, there were all sorts of disparaging comments made about Elizabeth Warren's understanding of economics from the head of JP Morgan and other banks, despite the fact that she was one of the leading academic scholars in the United States. Warren in this time frame reclaimed the slogan personnel is policy from Ronald Reagan. It was a Ronald Reagan era term to talk about how important appointments were in the government. And generally speaking, conservative movement figures as well as the American business community have long understood that the executive branch matters a lot. Keep in mind the United States with a distinct executive branch from the legislature and with a culture that devalues career people, where there are thousands of political appointments that run the executive branch in many jobs that in the UK and other countries, career people hold, those jobs are very frequently uh, held by political appointees. And so it had become the norm that those political appointees were either alumni of business or hoped to go work into business immediately following administration. So there started to be a critique and started to be attention paid. Um, but the belief, so even as this began as a movement within the Democratic Party in 2015 and 2016, it wasn't enough to dispel the notion that both political parties were too close to Wall Street. And actually toward the end of the campaign, Steve Bannon helped get Donald Trump to run against Wall Street influence in the Obama administration and argue that Hillary Clinton would be too close to Wall Street. This is ironic for the, the clip that Andy played at the beginning. It turns out that Goldman Sachs had essentially a subsidiary within the Trump administration. And Steve Bannon himself, the architect of this campaign, was a Goldman Sachs alum. But regardless of the facts, that this critique mattered. Um, and that helped, I think that belief that what had happened to the Democratic Party, that Donald Trump and his Goldman Sachs team were able to become more populist and run on being more critical of banks in the Democratic Party, helped strengthen the position of, of Elizabeth Warren and many other reformers in the Democratic Party during the course of the Trump years. What we at Revolving Door Project did during that time frame in uh, late 2019 and throughout 2020 um, as the presidential campaign was uh, going on is we organized a coalition to weigh in both publicly and privately with the campaigns and with the key figures within the Democratic Party that these jobs matter. Um, I will include in the chat a map that we built uh, toward that end, trying to demonstrate to people how we think corporate America views the executive branch, which is as something that is extremely important to their bottom lines, that depending on the sector, it could be the pharmaceutical sector, it could be Monsanto and other large agricultural concerns. If you are a big business, you know which jobs in the executive branch matter to you. We built a media narrative based on accurate research that connected potential job seekers and known job seekers and their personal history with potential conflicts of interest. We started to make people pay attention to executive branch appointments and to think about what could go wrong. We helped convince backers of Bernie Sanders uh, to make the appointments a key point of emphasis when they were building a coalition with Joe Biden to uh, present a united front in the general election. This had not been previously a concern of Bernie Sanders who had been more focused on an ambitious legislative agenda. And this made during the transition a point, uh, attention to uh, concern with appointments a bigger deal than had ever been before. 
when Tim Geithner and Larry Summers and the rest of the Barack Obama economic team took over uh, in 2008, 2009, despite the economic uh, collapse, there was not a lot of speculation. This was not a big part of the conversation in American politics as to who is Barack Obama going to appoint. This time, when Joe Biden made appointments, people were paying attention. And we think that the results were salutary, despite the fact that Joe Biden has about as traditional a biography as one can have within American politics of being friendly with many, not all corporations. Um, I, I, I think one shouldn't paint with too broad a brush, but he comes out of a tradition. The state of Delaware is arguably the most corporate friendly state in the United States, which has international implications. I'm sure many on this call are very aware of in terms of uh, secrets about corporate identity and uh, uh, ownership and the like. But yet under that, I think there have been some very significant wins under Joe Biden. His economic team is largely not Wall Street. And to the, the key exceptions are individuals who are extremely well liked from their service under Barack Obama and are largely seen as political people. And all of those people are going to, or at least nearly all of them are going to great lengths to try to dispel the notion that they are creatures of Wall Street, that if they spent a few years at BlackRock that does not define who they are. They are much more defensive about it. It is very different than the Clinton era of bragging on the fact that Robert Rubin used to run Goldman Sachs. The independent bank regulatory agencies, with one big exception in terms of the uh, Federal Reserve, which will be counted on our losses side, but the comptroller, the current, and the other thing to note is the United States has so many different independent bank regulatory agencies. <laughs> this is a uh, one of our many idiosyncrasies, but the comptroller, the currency, the acting one, the acting head of the federal, uh, the FDIC, the, the heads of the Securities and Exchange Commission, the CFTC, the, the CFPB, our consumer uh, regulator. These are people who are independent of and often seen as adversarial to Wall Street. This is a different world than under Clinton or Obama, and honestly, going back to Jimmy Carter as well. So this is kind of the first time we're seeing this in my lifetime. Uh, same is going on at anti-monopoly. And even the other side is now opting to make some of these kind of arguments. Uh, there is a regulatory appointee right now uh, for the vice chair for supervision at the Federal Reserve, who is a likable person, but Sarah Broom Laskin has done some problematic revolving door stuff. And Pat Toomey, the ranking senator, ranking Republican senator on the Senate Banking Committee, himself a former derivatives trader, asks, has been asking a lot of searching questions about the revolving door ties of Sarah Broom Raskin. That is good. You need both political parties to see this as an issue. Um, and then even people who are somewhat revolving door figures, like the nominee to run the Food and Drug Administration, uh, Robert Califf uh, and the Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin each have some revolving door stints, but they've agreed to a four-year cooling off period. Um, Austin, when he leaves office, and Califf, if he does get to become FDA, uh, run the FDA, which is in question at the moment, he's agreed that for four years following his service, he will essentially go to none of the firms that may have benefited from what he did in service. So that would be uh, help establish a brand new norm, which would be terrific. There are still some losses, as I mentioned, uh, a handful of people who worked for BlackRock before um, is, uh, you know, uh, some of them are doing, seem to be doing pretty good work, like Brian Deese at the National Economic Council. Some I'm a little more, more skeptical about what Wally Adamo is or is not doing at the Treasury Department. But they're all very cognizant that for their future ambitions, they need to be seen as independent of Wall Street. But they did get in through ties to BlackRock, which is obviously a very powerful financial services firm. And I think the biggest loss at the moment, the thing that we are trying to fight on the hardest as I bring this to a close and discuss the future, is there's not yet been adequate attention to how to rebuild an ethos of career service within our public service. Uh, we need civil servants in the United States who view their job in government as a win, 
They view a career job as something that means that that is going to be their principal job in their professional lives, that that is the apogee of their career. Maybe they had a previous career in law or business or what have you, but we want somebody, once they go to a regulator, to say, okay, I am 40 now, I hope to work until 70, and for the next 30 years, this job reflects my point of view. And so that means I can be skeptical of the institutions I'm regulating. That doesn't mean the, the regulated industry is always wrong, but you do not want overly credulous people in government. Uh, so the future holds that we need to elevate these concerns about career people leaving because you have regulators in the United States that have not been skeptical of regulated corporations for the last 40 to 50 years. And turning these institutions around is difficult. And we need to make these jobs prestigious. We need to make an, ex, uh, an assumption that is a success to get one of these jobs. And your goal is to move up within these agencies and spend your career there and to not spend your time thinking about how can they make more money in the private sector and leverage this current job for my future job. And so that is the challenge that we are facing at this moment. Wow, Jeff, that was absolutely superb. You've made such powerful points and your experience in the US, we can really relate to the sorts of things that you've been observing and witnessing over there. And, and frankly, you've clearly, clearly, you and your organization, your small team have clearly done a great job to help elevate the importance of the revolving door problem. And no doubt, absolutely no doubt in my mind, you really are making a difference. We can learn so, so much from what you've been up to. That was absolutely superb, Jeff. Thank you very, very much. We're going to go to our next speaker, Sabrina, in a moment. But before we do, let me just check in. Please wave a hand at me if you'd like to come in with a comment or a question. Otherwise, we will move on to Sabrina shortly. Um, Andy Schmuller, Dr. Schmuller, you've just raised your hand. Uh, please do share your thoughts. Thank you. Well, thank you, Andy. Um, and um, I'm looking forward to hearing what uh, Signora Pinadelli has to say. Buongiorno. Um, Jeff, uh, there are some points of difference uh, that I have with you. Perhaps it's a different perspective. Uh, perhaps it's a different perspective from Australia. Um, and I say this with, uh, with all due respect, um, having started life out as a great America file. Um, and now I look at America and I see a I see your countrymen are comprised of beasts. Uh, they are beasts. They are not humans. Um, and one of the things I notice about our civil service and our regulators is it is predominantly staffed by uh, people who have it as their lifelong profession. And um, there are we don't have the same level of um, uh, slicing and dicing, to use a, a term from a global financial crisis. We don't have the same level of machinating uh, between uh, uh, powerful uh, financial industry executives revolving into government that you do. Uh, Andy, Andy, uh, forgive, me, forgive, forgive me, I'm going to cut in there. I'll tell you why. We'll pick up on this point later. It's a really, really interesting line of thought. Sabrina needs to go off to do a TV interview shortly. So what we're going to do is we're going to time out there on the Q&A bit at this point and simply pass over to Sabrina Pinadoli, uh, who will be speaking for a few minutes before going on to her TV interview. But I promise Andy will come back to you very, very shortly. Before we do anything else, though, folks, let's uh, please do join me in thanking Jeff for his session. Jeff, thank you very, very much indeed. That really was wonderful. And as I said earlier, we can learn a great deal from you. Uh, Sabrina is going to be responding to some questions that I'll be putting to her. Sabrina is a wonderful member of the European Parliament in Italy. So, Sabrina, I'm going to uh, go to gallery view and... I'm going to be asking you some questions, please, if you are happy to respond to them for me. And the first question, of course, Sabrina, is please tell us a little bit about yourself and your role as a member of the European Parliament. Thank you. 
thank you, Andy, and, and thank you for the organization of this meeting. And I'm sorry for uh, this problem uh, with uh, TV and uh, interview. And um, before becoming a member of European Parliament, I was uh, an investigative journalist. Uh, and uh, I wrote about uh, mafia in uh, Northern Italy and also in uh, Europe, uh, in Germany uh, in particular. And uh, now, uh, as a member of the parliament, uh, I, I'm working uh, on uh, the freedom of press, uh, on the justice, uh, on the transparency, and uh, also on the rule of law and uh, the artificial intelligence. They could be different fields uh, from the mafia, but I think it's very interesting because, uh, uh, for example, I can put uh, uh, together the artificial intelligence organized crime because, uh, for example, there is uh, the big problem of uh, the uh, cyber crime and the prevention of the cyber crime. And um, I think it's a very interesting experience for me. Thank you very much indeed. You have a remarkably interesting background and how wonderful it is that we have a former investigative journalist in such a prominent role within the European Parliament. That's wonderful. And uh, please tell us, Sabrina, about the, forgive my pronunciation, it's going to be awful, but please tell us about the Monte dei Pasci di Siena uh, case, the MPS case, and, and why that is so significant to you and of concern to your colleagues as well. Thank you. Monte dei Paschi di Siena is uh, one of the oldest banks in the world and, uh, and uh, is uh, a typical case of a revolving door because there is uh, one man that is uh, Pier Carlo Paduan that do a lot of things in different rules. And uh, in, uh, in 2016, uh, as a Minister of Economy and Finance, Paduan oversaw the rescue of MPS uh, from bankruptcy uh, using 5 billion euros uh, of taxpayers' money. In uh, 2018, Paduan, after serving as a minister, uh, was elected as a member of the Italian parliament uh, in the uh, constituency of Siena. That uh, is where um, MPS is based. Mm -hmm. Then, in October 2020, Padoan left the parliament uh, to become CEO of the Unicre uh, Unicredit Banking Group. This group would like to buy MPS, but not all the bank, only the strategic assets and uh, not the bad loans. This uh, caused the closure of 50 branches and uh, uh, the loss of uh, uh, 5,000 uh, jobs. Obviously, all of this is on the shoulder of the state and obviously on the shoulder of the citizen. And, uh, and there is another problem because uh, uh, all of this uh, uh, strategy uh, puts Italy at risk because the European Commission, in response of my written question, uh, say that uh, this situation could have repercussions on the disbursement of the recovery fund, that is the money for uh, gift by Europe uh, for the COVID, uh, because uh, probably the rule of law uh, could not be uh, respected. The rule of law is uh, the a lot uh, is um, is about, uh, uh, for example, the human rights, the uh, the freedom of press, and uh, the division of institution. And uh, if uh, is a member state uh, not respect this uh, rule of law, uh, the European institution uh, uh, could could decide to uh, stop. Uh, the, to pay the uh, funds. And uh, this is uh, the situation of uh, MPS. Thank you very much indeed. It must be one of the most egregious uh, bad cases ever of um, exploitation and manipulation. And frankly, it sounds to me a bit like corruption. Forgive me for such using such a strong word, but it really, it really does. And I'm not surprised that you and your colleagues 
are doing what you can about it. Um, but please tell us uh, in general terms what you think about the revolving door uh, uh, as a problem and, and what can be done about it. Please go on to tell us about what you and your colleagues are planning to do this year regarding revolving door. Thank you. And uh, um, I think the revolving door is a big problem, but uh, is uh, uh, is uh, uh, far away from uh, the daily life of the citizens. So it's difficult uh, for people to understand the connection with, uh, uh, for example, uh, the problem of the democracy, uh, the problem, uh, the good functioning of uh, an institution, and uh, also the. Uh, um, uh, the economic problem because uh, uh, the taxpayer uh, pay for uh, this kind of revolving door problems. And uh, with my colleagues, uh, I hope uh, to uh, create, uh, to work in a double level. One in a, a European level, because uh, uh, it's important to have uh, as far as it's possible a, a new law to uh, stop the revolving door. Now we have only uh, the principle that, uh, for example, for a European institution for uh, 12 months, is it not possible uh, to go to work for a lobby? But it's not a real rule because uh, there is a staff that uh, can choose case by case and every time they choose, mm -hmm. yes, it's possible to go to work to lobby. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so it's uh, is not uh, uh, easy, but uh, uh, the most important part is uh, to work also in the national level, because uh, if we have uh, an European uh, law, but the uh, member states don't have uh, a legislation uh, that is uh, like the European law is uh, totally unusual. Thank you very much, Sabrina. And as you know, we are working collaboratively with as many stakeholders as we can around the world to try to bring people together internationally to uh, find ways to join our efforts to expose this problem as best as we can and to try to influence rules and regulations. Uh, you've been very, uh, you and your colleagues have been wonderfully engaged with this process over the, the last couple of months, which we are gr very grateful for. Uh, what are your general thoughts about the idea that people like us, all the stakeholders around the world, should find a way to work together to expose the problem of revolving door and to try to do something about it? Yes, I, I think it's very important to work uh, in a team uh, because uh, it's important to see the problem uh, with different point of view. And uh, I think the revolving door is not only a political problem, uh, they have... Uh, it uh, have not uh, only uh, political implication. Uh, there are very important economic aspects, uh, for example, about uh, the competition, about uh, uh, the rule of uh, control of the market. And, um, and uh, there are also sociological and ethical aspects. Uh, that uh, is uh, why the contribution of uh, Everyone is important, uh, association, uh, politicians, uh, economists, uh, entrepreneurs, but uh, uh, I think it's very important to raise the awareness of the citizen. And uh, now for, uh, uh, to, to explain them the, the importance of the rule of law and the connection with economic aspects, the uh, good functioning of institutions, and uh, the transparency, the necessity of transparency of, of institution and um, our democracy, I think. And uh, now uh, I'm uh, explaining uh, this uh, project uh, in uh, the in, um, transparency in, uh, intergroup in the European Parliament to have uh, the, the collaboration with our, our colleagues with my colleagues and uh, to uh, involve them in, the round, in this round table to see the aspect in different point of view. Mm. And uh, now uh, we would like to organize a, um, a public event to uh, mm. explain the problem and uh, to raise the awareness of the citizens. Sabrina, thank you very much indeed. We'll let you go off to your TV interview very, very shortly, but just before you go, uh, from the Transparency Task Force's point of view, we are 
very grateful to you for engaging with us so openly and so helpfully. Uh, we wish you all the very best with the activities that you are undertaking in the EU to bring key stakeholders together and we wish to support you all the way. It's been wonderful to have you with us today, Sabrina. Thank you very, very much indeed. We'll thank you there and show our appreciation, Sabrina. Thank you very much. Perfect. Enjoy your interview. Thank you very, very much indeed. Wonderful. Uh, super stuff. Thank you. And uh, we're going to go straight back to uh, Dr. Andy Schmulo in Sydney. So Andy, do you want to pick up from there, please? And uh, uh, by all means, go back to where you were before, if you wish, or pick up from where, wherever you'd like to. Folks, it's, it's just gone quarter past one UK time. Uh, Andy's going to be finishing his session at roughly half past, and then we'll throw it open for general Q&A and discussion after that. Andy Schmulo, back to you, sir. Thank you. Jeff, I was just saying, uh, we have professional, we, we have career um, civil servants in Australia, and, uh, you know, it's just been a catastrophe absolute catastrophe. Our, our regulators have been described at an official level as weak, feckless and timid. Uh, and the degree to which the capture of our regulators was evidenced uh, by our Royal Commission, I think it's fair to say is a source of national shame and embarrassment. Um, so, you know, I, I would say to you that um, don't put too much stock in, uh, in, in, in the belief that a professional civil service will somehow solve that problem. One thing that I did find very interesting uh, is in my extensive discussions with um, Professor, Professor Patricia McCoy, who uh, is the Liberty Mutual Professor of uh, uh, Insurance Law at Boston College or Boston University, I forget, and she was instrumental in uh, establishing the CFPB. And uh, she was a senior advisor in the Obama administration and uh, she was the foundation deputy, uh, I'm not sure what the head of the CFPB is called, chair. Is, it, is that the most senior person at the CFPB? Are they called a chair? Uh, chief high over God, whatever. She was the deputy and she was in charge of mortgages which is obviously the most um, director. She was the deputy director of the CFPB uh, in charge of mortgages at the end of the, the, the global financial crisis, a crisis that began in the subprime mortgage industry. So she's tremendously influential. And um, the CFPB, uh, I think, was, was established uh, in a way that was very successful successful enough that it managed to resist uh, the onslaught from number 45. I can barely bring myself to say the man's name. And uh, Patricia McCoy, although I should note, he did, in fairness, I, I, know, I know Senator Warren criticized Donald Trump, but in fairness, he did point out to us all that he is a very stable genius. So there you go. Um, she said that what it came down to was leadership that it came down to leadership of the organization, uh, which she said was absolutely essential for driving the right kind of ethos. And uh, the, the leadership that we've had in our regulators in Australia, ASIC and APRA, have been somewhere between pitiful and pathetic. Uh, the head of our bank regulator, APRA, is in my view a gibbering idiot. And, um, you know, he, the, the stories I could tell you of his just his, his gobsmacking incompetence. Um, but let's come back to the revolving door. You know, we, we hear the story from Signorina Pinadelli of the Bangadabashi scandal, and uh, there are so many other examples like it. And one of the things that uh, I think has been quite interesting to emanate from South Korea is their uh, Public Service Act, which bans anyone who has worked for a regulator from working for a regulated entity for three years after they leave the regulator. Not just bans them from working in a 
regulated entity that was regulated by the regulator they worked for. They're banned from working in any regulated entity. So if they worked for the healthcare regulator, they can't work for an oil and gas company. If they worked for um, a uh, telecommunications regulator, they can't work for a financial services company for three years. And uh, I think that's a very good template. It does have it. It does have a flaw. The South Korean model does have a flaw. If you want to, this is not a plug for my book. But if you want to have a read of the South Korean regime, there's a chapter on it in, in, in this book. Um, it does have a flaw which is similar to that of, similar to the flaw that Signorina Pemadeli mentioned, which is that there is a degree of discretion allowed uh, as to whether the rule should be applied immediately, that should raise a red flag. There is no need for discretion. It should be a hard and fast rule. You work for a regulated entity at the very least, you must not work for, if you work for a regulator, you must not work for a regulated entity at the very least in the same industry for three years, no exceptions. End of story. Um, I, I don't necessarily apply the same rule in reverse. I think that there are advantages for a regulator to co-opt people from regulated entities so that they can understand how, uh, how the scheming and the, and the machinating is done in the industry. I think there are some advantages to that, but moving in the other direction, moving from the regulator to a regulated uh, entity, out of the question. It's a conflict of interest and we've seen that this has uh, evidenced undermining and white anting uh, and uh, circumscribing the powers and the efficacy of regulators everywhere in the world where this has happened. And I think that um, I'm a huge admirer of Liz Elizabeth Warren. Uh, I think it's a great, great shame that Joseph Biden didn't choose her as his vice president. I think it's a great shame the Democratic Party didn't choose her as their candidate. Uh, I think she's an outstanding individual. And I, I take her point that uh, personnel are policy, but I think that, certainly I think in Australia, what we need is we need a legislative regime that lays down a hard and fast rule. If you work for ASIC, uh, you may not work for a financial services firm within three years of leaving ASIC. Same with APRA, our bank regulator. And, you know, um, I'm, I'm, sure that, I'm sure that this is the case in the United, even in the United States, which is a country that has unfortunately conceptualized uh, every aspect of success around how much money have you got. Mm -hmm. There doesn't seem to be any any imagination as to other forms of success other than how much money have you got and how you got it is irrelevant. And, and I think that that has led to this, this profoundly warped, corrupted culture, which in its most extreme examples is, is evidenced in, in forms like the prosperity doctrine. Because, you know, Jesus always said, make more money. Um, we're not, we're not quite that kind of avaricious in Australia and we do have more kind of a sense of, you know, it's not, your, the whole of your entity is not defined by the size of your bank balance. And I think that one of the things that we see in regulated entities, in, in regulators, is that there are plenty of people in regulators who want to do a good job. It's the same reason why people join the police force. They understand they could make more money being criminals, but they feel a calling to be a policeman. And there are without doubt, so many examples of that. There are people who feel a calling to become a public prosecutor and will continue to be a public prosecutor despite the fact that they could make a lot more money defending criminals. And uh, we see that in regulators. There are people particularly in lower and middle management 
who want to become good enforcers, but they are undermined by uh, the feckless, gibbering idiots uh, like the head of our, our bank regulator, Wayne Byers, who, I mean, how that man is in the position he's in, I just find it absolutely gobsmacking. We have a, we have a, um, we've had a, a bank executive accountability regime in Australia since 1998. Uh, there's a particular section of, of the Banks Act which allows APRA, it's quite clear, it's quite an, uh, unambiguous. It allows APRA to remove directors from the board of a company where those directors aren't doing a good job or where the board is, or where the company is not being well run. Like, you know, I don't know, so many thousands of examples that we've seen in Australia for the last 20 years. Uh, Commonwealth Bank breaching money laundering legislation 53,000 times then. We thought that was terrible until we saw Westpac had breached money laundering legislation 23 million times. Uh, they've never exercised their powers under this provision to remove directors from the board. I sent it through to a member of parliament, our federal parliament. He asked Wayne Bayes why he'd never used that term. The guy turned around and he said that's the, 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 the section is about um, uh, disqualification of directors. It has got nothing to do with disqualification of directors. Disqualification directors is under a heading rather cunningly called disqualification of directors in a different section of the act. So the guy doesn't have a clue. He doesn't know how to read legislation. He has no capacity for original thought. He's the highest paid civil servant in Australia. But there are so many people below him who are trying to do a good job. Those above them and those who are avaricious and those who have no moral center, uh, who are spinning through the revolving door, part of what they do is they demoralize and they dispirit those below and around them who want to do a good job. So it's not everybody in the regulator who wants to spin through the revolving door. There's just a particular kind of, of parasite that wants to do that. And I think that if you shut that door, uh, that's a good start. And I think the South Korean legislation is worthy of, of having a look. It has a flaw. The, the, the author of the chapter, the authors of the chapter are quite candid about that flaw. That flaw speaks to the flaw that Signorina Pinodelli was referring to. But I think, I think there's something in there. I think, though, if you rely on... Uh, if you rely on the goodwill of professional civil servants. Well, let me put it to you this way. Um, I, I think Australia, I think misconduct in our financial industry, I think it's fair to say is, has, has probably, certainly before the Royal Commission had reached a level where uh, it's worse than Wall Street. Wow, well, that's saying something, Andy. That's saying something. Andy, thank you very, very much indeed. Thank you very much. Let's show our appreciation to Andy. Then we've got uh, a great opportunity to open this up for conversation. Thank you very much indeed. Straight talking as always, as always. So much to talk about here. Uh, Chandela put his hand up a while ago. Then we're going to go to Mark Falcon. So I'm going to attempt to kind of uh, facilitate a discussion amongst us all. Chandela, please turn your camera on if you can. And then we'll go to Mark, then to Mark Falcon and Mark Bishop, and then we'll open it right up. Chandela, if you're there, please uh, share your thought. Thank you. Hi, Andy. Hi. Hello. Uh, yeah, I was just trying to get the camera on. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, my question really was uh, a twofold in terms of uh, what Jeff was saying. Um, you know, if you join a political administration, then you find your way into uh, a regulatory position. Um, the challenge we have in the UK, obviously, in terms of people who sit in statutory bodies, often is the Official Secrets Act. In other words, what you sign up to, in other words, preventing you to talk about what you actually go and do, which then prohibits people when they try to pursue those same individuals for wrongdoing in the context of discharging their duty of care. Do you feel in America you have a stronger chance of pursuing someone who, let's say, sits in the top of the regulator than we perhaps have here? Is I that think, a question to me, Chandler, or to Jeff? I think let's go to Jeff first, then we'll jump back to you, Andy. Thank you. I think oversight of regulatory failure is a weakness in America. Uh, 
first off, all of American politics right now is viewed through a partisan lens. And so there is not a lot of opportunity uh, for scrutiny in that regard. And then our Congress is not as attentive to its responsibilities in oversight of the executive branch as it ought to be um, because they are, you know, they fund and theoretically oversee the executive branch. They see themselves as prime, uh, as having primacy in, in new legislation and they're just not attentive. So uh, while lack of transparency and information about what causes failure in the executive branch is an issue, um, I think there is a will issue. Uh, the inspector general position within the United States government is still somewhat functional on a department by department basis. And I think is the best measure we have to kind of address that concern. Thank you, Jeff. Let's go to Andy for his thoughts on that. And then we'll go to Mark to see if you'd like to add a point about it as well. Andy? I'm not, I'm not qualified to, to answer that question, Andy. That's why I queried whether the I thought Chad Miller had asked me, but I think the question should have gone to, to yeah, Jeff. It did, did. Thank you, Andy. Mark, anything you'd like to say about this matter to do with regulatory oversight and political um, sensitivities? Yeah, <clears throat> thanks, Andy. Um, yeah, I'd have liked to have spoken on the panel on this because I've got very strong feelings about it. And I have been both a regulator and worked in industry. Um, <laughs> and I think we've heard some very powerful um, evidence you know, from Mark and <clears throat> from Jeff in particular. And I think I, I certainly... I hold to blame the most is President Reagan, because it was Reagan who did down um, the role of public servants and the role of the government. <clears throat> um, and, and that's much of the root of the, of, of the problem around the world. But at the same time, I think that um, calling it the resolving revolving door problem is a big misnomer. And I think mischaracterizes the problem <clears throat> for the reasons that Andy says, because what it suggests is that um, you have to make a choice when you start your career, that either you work in the public sector or you work in, in industry. And, and that's no, nobody at the start of their career can reasonably make that choice. Um, and, wh and when you do sing it happen, and if, and, if, and if it meant that, that you had this separation, you'd end up with a problem exactly as Andy describes, that um, you, you've got a professional civil service that um, have, very, have, have very little real world or commercial experience and, and, and uh, often end up being incompetent for that reason. So I think, uh, you know, having my, uh, my career experience started off, you know, and I've moved, you know, in a number of times between the public sector and um, okay. industry, um, that there isn't an inherent conflict of interest. Um, and it's for the reason that Andy says that, and, and, and the way to resolve it isn't to say you cannot move um, from, you've got to make that choice. You can't move between industry and um, the uh, being a regulator or a public servant, uh, but, the, but the, there have to be much clearer rules of independence and there's got to be leadership and integrity. Um, so I think that's my main observation that um, I, I get quite frustrated by this terminology of the revolving door problem because that's not the problem. Um, and, and by shutting the revolving door doesn't solve it. It's a bigger problem. Um, and, and it's much of the work that, that you're doing, Andy, to address that. Um, so that's my, my chief observation. Well, thank you very much indeed. It, it's, it's great that you make this point because you're uh, essentially you're saying this is not really so much a structural problem. It's more about the basic idea and expectation that people in positions of influence uh, either side of the fence uh, need to have integrity um, and need to have ethics. Um, That's right. I, I, I wonder then whether we are... <laughs> I wonder when, whether we are starting to expect too much from senior people for, in having ethics and standards. I mean, recent political um, observations aside, uh, we really do seem to have a problem. People in power seem to lack ethics. I don't know if that's uh, an oversimplification, maybe it is, but it really does seem to be the case that there are, are remarkably few people with a lot of influence who seem to base decisions on what's right and what's wrong and with ethics and standards and given that reality maybe we need some kind of framework to make them do the right thing it shouldn't be the case at all i absolutely agree with you it shouldn't be yeah. the case at all but maybe we need something given the human frailties and the greed in the system that there so clearly is thanks mark that was a great input mr mark bishop to you then we'll go to shan 
Uh, thanks so much, Neil Andy. I'd like to really address this debate, um, I guess, about whether it is the revolving door the right name? You know, is it wrong to have um, any kind of bar on people moving from industry to regulator and, and back again? Um, I remember once having a conversation with somebody reasonably senior about the FCA, about the revolving door. And, and I said, well, you know, maybe there should be a, a ban a bit like the South African, uh, sorry, the uh, South Korean one on people moving from the FCA into industry roles. And, and this individual said to me, um, well, you know, you'd be breaching their human rights. Um, you'd be unfairly constraining their ability to earn a living. Um, and I thought about that and I thought, well, I'm not a lawyer, so I can't comment on whether that's right or wrong. But, but actually, to Mark Falcon's point, you know, I don't think it's intrinsically wrong that, that there should be moved from regulator to industry or vice versa. The problem comes when that affords opportunities that should not be afforded to that person. For example, you know, to go easy on the firm that they were, um, you know, once working for or that they expect to work for in the future. And, and that could quite easily be resolved, actually, um, because what you do is don't create a, a, a blanket ban, but simply say you cannot be expected to move from a regulator into a firm whose fate you might have had an opportunity to influence while you were a regulator. And similarly, you cannot move from a firm into the regulator in a role in which you might be able to influence the fate of that firm. Um, and that, I think, is not unreasonable. You can build a very strong case for why it is rational. Um, and it also affords the legitimate point that, um, that Mark, Mark offered us, which is, you know, actually people should be able to develop their careers. And, you know, there are good and honest regulators who should be able to work in the industry. There are good and honest people from the industry who should be able to work as regulators. So I kind of offer that as a sensible suggestion. And when I was giving my presentation, I said, you know, whatever you're doing as a financial services campaigner, don't just criticise, come up with constructive solutions. I actually would go a stage further, um, you know, referencing some conversations I've had recently with uh, people about um, some of the consultation responses that we do. Um, I've said, in a way, if you can eliminate everything that is Re, you know, deal with every concern that is reasonable. The one thing that's left is that which is unreasonable. And if you want to demonstrate to some that somebody is being unreasonable, deal with all of the reasonable stuff first. So I just offer that as a, as a compromise that I think ought to work if people are being reasonable. Can I, uh, can I offer a, a, a response to Mark, Andy? Yeah, go for it. Uh, Mark, um, I am a lawyer. And uh, please, would you pass my sentiments on to the person who said to you it would be a breach of their human rights? My uh, technical legal response to that is bullshit. <laughs> okay. uh, there are very few rights that are absolute. Uh, most rights are uh, properly regarded as a balancing act. So, for example, I have a right of free speech, but I don't have the right to engage in libel, defamation, criminal defamation. Uh, misrepresentation by statement, um, incitement to violence, racial vilification, uh, sedition, uh, treason, etc. That's eight off the top of my head. Eight limitations to my right of free speech off the top of my head. Um, I might regard it as my human right to walk around naked. It's a limitation on that, public indecency. Uh, so human rights are a balancing act and i would suggest that there is an an eminently reasonable balancing act when you say to somebody you're not banned from working in industry forever but you are banned for three years and when you say well there could be advantages and it's not necessarily the case that bad things will happen oh. no that is true. Uh, it's not absolutely guaranteed that bad things will happen, but we see that the risk of bad things happening is so great. Yeah. And the anecdotal and empirical evidence that bad things happen is so extensive that it is reasonable to turn around and say, no working for a firm that you regulated for three years. Why? 
because the prospect of working for that firm becomes an inducement, a what Senator Warren called a pre-bribe to look after me now so that you will be looked after in future. But please, now tech, the technical terminology that I'd like to pass to your learned friend about human rights abuses, bullshit. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. Uh, Mark's made the point to me before that um, uh, one of the issues with this problem is that if, it's, if it becomes known that people in senior roles can get very well paid jobs in the banking sector, for example, then, then surely that must become a cultural driver of their expectations and their career path. And then you end up with this, this kind of this vicious circle that's just going to get harder and harder to break. I, I really do think that there must be at least some people who know they are not doing the best they could do to protect consumers and society from harm because they have this personal hope and expectation that one day they'll get a really, really lucrative job. And in the meantime, they'll obviously um, bear that in mind when they start get, getting into dialogue with banks and so on and so forth. Really and interesting you know, stuff. What, what, one further point. Yep. And I have a word, Andy. It's yep. late, it's 20 to one. Yeah. And most of the session has been about, we want, Mark wants constructive ideas. And I think you come back to your framework. We've got the wrong framework. It's not constructive. And the question I wanted to ask Sabrina, but she's gone, so I'll ask it to Jeff. And that is, we need a different framework. And have you considered using, using the uh, Ralph Nader's framework of bottom-up regulation by having citizen, having given power and information to citizens to challenge the, to be co-regulators by having citizen utility boards? How and will the, citizens and, regulate mini bonds, Shan? Hey, pardon? How will and, 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 your, and your proposal for top-down regulation in Australia, we now have the, uh, the regulator of the regulators. Correct. Chaired, Correct. chaired, chaired by the, the most highly paid ex-executive of the most powerful bank in Australia. Which, uh, which I have criticised up, very heavily. Which I have criticised up his own conflicts of interest. And which I made strenuous representations to parliamentarians not to allow. But this... This obsession <laughs> but and, is what we've got. <laughs> it, is, it is what we've got. And, and that's evidence of the fact that wars comprise many battles. We've won a few battles. We've lost a few battles. The war is not over. One of the battles that I did win was the representations that I made to Senator Nick McKim. I said to him, here are the problems with the FRAA Act. Here are the problems that I've identified. He said, I've got enough bandwidth to tackle one. Which one do you want me to tackle? And I said to him, kick Treasury out of the process. He kicked Treasury out of the process. It went back to the lower house. They were distracted by COVID. The bill passed, Treasury's out. We won that battle. We lost the battle where, uh, what's his name? Nick, uh, the former head of Macquarie, uh, whatever his name is. It is a disgrace that he's, a, that he's the head of the FR, FRAA. It is typical of our Tory government. It is typical of the way in which and, they are turning Australia and into that, a pro And that structure and framework however, is Shan, your, recommend, however, your, Shan, rec it's your Shan, recommendation. And however, let's, give Nick, let's Shan, give Jeff a call. How are, Jeff, um, get, how are you going to get ordinary citizens to regulate mini bonds? What we'll do, folks, um, obviously, we need to make sure that we... Uh, organize the event in such a way that we don't accidentally have people speaking over each other. So clearly, clearly, there's a lot of uh, strong feeling here, particularly in relation to uh, the Australian perspective. Um, so Shan put a question to Jeff effectively, which was any thoughts, Jeff, about how citizen involvement can act as a catalyst for the kind of reforms and protections that we uh, are talking about today. Jeff, any, any, any sort of thoughts about that? Any developments in that direction in the USA. Then we'll go back to Mark Bishop and then to Paul Increasing. Thank you, Jeff. There, the main area of, ex, of experimentation in the United States with citizen involvement is a handful of states which are uh, incorporating citizen input into their redistricting. That is uh, the process by which Americans every decade after the census uh, draw the constituencies for legislative bodies. 
And I think that the experience shows that there can be some positive value add if people are uh, chosen outside the ranks of political elites and have the time to get involved, but it's not a, it's not a, necessarily a solution, but it can be somewhat more credible to broader number of people and potentially re lead to somewhat better outcomes. But in America, we're kind of a hopelessly polarized country in which people are following cues from the top down. We are less of a bottoms up culture right now in terms of the um, mechanism of modern communications. And so I'm not sure that there's anything utopian or massive uh, uh, gains that are to be made in that way. Thank you, Jeff. Very interesting indeed. We're going to go to Pauline and anyone else who hasn't had a chance to say their piece, then we'll jump back to Mark and others. Uh, Pauline, uh, go for it. Thank you. Hi, thank you. I just wanted to say quickly, um, some very good points made from all the speakers, but wanted to say we haven't really spoken about the influence or the far reaching, um, far reaching reach of the mass media in all of this. Um, they are very much interwoven into the revolving door and supporting certain candidates, particularly the super powerful and the super rich. And as a result of that, they're very influential um, in, in the political economy, which affects everybody. Um, I think that's, if I may say, Jeff, you can correct me if I'm wrong, I think that's particularly strong, the media uh, and the power of it in, in America, but, it, but it's happening in the UK and, it, and it's happening globally. There have been books written about it um, several decades ago, which I think are still relevant, you know, by um, Herman and uh, Chomsky, although they were talking about political events, but it was also referring to the power of the economic hitmen that they used to send around to different countries in order to control economies and political outcomes. Uh, but they were all being driven by bankers and Wall Street and, you know, the city in London. They were going out there to take control of banks and industries out there and to get the political governments they want. And it's very powerful. And then the media is also encouraging the consumer, the public, to, to not look at how dreadful this all is, but saying, look at these people, they're super rich, look at what they've got. And I just draw your attention briefly, you may think this is totally inappropriate, but I was just horrified. There's a couple of people that have been interviewed recently on a program on Channel 5 called under Sally Lindsay's Posh Weekends with the Super Rich. And I recognized, um, two guys that I knew very well there from business, one of whom is just an out and out fraudster, but he's got away with it. And he's living this super rich lifestyle, um, you know, on, on, his, on an island uh, <laughs> and left the UK because he was being, you know, bothered by a few people, but he's got away with it. And it was all about, you know, the great lifestyle they had. And, uh, you know, and again, a lot of people watch that. It's entertainment on a Saturday night, prime time, nine o'clock. A lot of people look at that and think, yes, that's the life I want. And you get that across all sections of society. And this is why the revolving door is so lucrative and so appealing to people that perhaps did once have ethics, but they just think, well, money rules the world and I wanna be up there. I don't wanna be working my ass off you know, forever. And the public uh, aspire to that. They hang around those people. They aspire to the super rich, a lot of them. Uh, you know, we're probably in a minority here and we have to factor that in. So sorry, I just wanted to raise the power of the of the media in all of this, if I may. Thank you very much indeed. I think your point about the media is really valid. And also, if I may, I'm just going to read out something, something that Anne-Marie Borg put in the chat earlier, because she made a point very similar to what you just said. She said, um, I may be off topic, but does it not all start fundamentally with building an education system towards a more ethical society, not just seeing things in terms of financial success driven. Uh, I think you made that point very well indeed, Pauline, as well. Thanks, Anne-Marie, too. D does anybody who hasn't yet had a chance to say anything would like to speak now? Uh, otherwise, we'll jump to Mark Bishop. We'll have Mark's final comments, then we'll go to Andy Schmulo for his final comments, and then we'll go to Jeff for his final comments, and then we'll bring the session to a close. Wave a hand at me if you do, otherwise we'll go to Mark Bishop. Mark's got his hand up, Andy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll go to Mark now. Mark, over to you for your point and your final comments. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, thank you. So I just really want to tap into that debate that's just happened between uh, Shan Turner and, uh, and Andy Schmulo, uh, really, which is top down versus bottom up. Uh, and really, in a way, both were arguing for the, the something similar, some overlap, you know, which is, you know, at the, the bottom up 
do you have consumers on, for example, the boards of you know, financial services businesses or at least financial services products you know, representing the consumer interest? And at the top, do you have the financial regulators assessment authority or something similar, keeping an eye on what the regulator does and whether it's delivering for consumers? Um, and I think that the, you know, both the strength and the weakness of those proposals lay, lays in who is appointed to do this work. And if I were running a financial services business and I wanted an easy ride, I would choose plastic consumers, people who are pretending to be consumers, but are really from the industry, just like the FCA chooses the people on its consumer panel. You know, similarly, if I was looking at an oversight board, I would put on there a bunch of people from the financial services industry, which is something that unfortunately happened in Australia, you know, with an otherwise brilliant, you know, an idea for sol solving the problem. So what really I took away from that is that, you know, give them an inch and they'll take a mile, you cannot trust the financial services industry or its proxies in the treasury in any country to behave with anything approaching integrity. What you've got to do is you've got to write the regulations in such a way that there is absolutely no hiding place. They have to do things the way that you want them to do it. You know, so for example, this is a controversial suggestion, but you know, do you empower all of the voters in say a an unit trust or an investment trust, some kind of collective investment scheme, do you give all of them a right to vote? You know, if so, how do you empower that the right people step forward to be candidates and not just industry proxies step forward to do that? Similarly, what do you do about an oversight body? How do you make sure it really is from consumer interest? It's got to be written into the legislation, I think. You can't trust these people as far as you can throw them. For that reason, my concluding thought, which is actually quite a depressing one, is that I would kind of respectfully degree, disagree, you know, with, with Mark and with, uh, with Anne-Marie. I don't think this is about ethics. I don't think it's about ethics at all. The, the problem about ethics is we can all pretend to have them, but actually behave in an unethical way. Um, I think this is about the, the dots and the I, on the I's being dotted and the T's being crossed. It's about the exact detail of what the rules are and making people do what they're told. Well, thank you very much indeed. This is such a thought provoking event and clearly there's so many different opinions about the way forward here. Mark, thank you not just for that, but also for your contribution earlier. It was absolutely first class as always. Dr. Andy Schmulo, your final comments, please, before we quickly go to Jeff Hauser. Pauline, um, just coming back to something Pauline said um, <laughs> about the media. Uh, let's give it a name. News Corp. You know, they've... Uh, They've suborned American democracy. They've suborned British democracy. Uh, they control 75% of the media in Australia. Um, most of their tabloids didn't have a word to say about anything to do with the Royal Commission. Um, and Rupert Murdoch has been on record as saying, when asked what his success was, he said, keep my readers dumb and keep them angry. And the wow. easiest things to keep them dumb and angry about is something to do with sport find something about sport and that'll keep them angry and occupied and Karl Marx said religion is the opiate of the masses the only reason he said that was because he lived in an age before televised sport um so that's that's my view I think Pauline uh if we had media that educated people people would look around and go my god what is going on here mm. the mm. financial industry is committing financial rape on an industrial scale and the government's just looking the other way. We used to have investigative journalists going on. I'm old enough to remember it, but it's just died. It's been subversed, it's been buried, and it's very difficult to get anyone interested now because they're too scared what their senior editors are going to say and it will affect their advertising revenue. That's mm. the simplistic answers that I'm given, but I think it goes much deeper than that. I think The Guardian is still... A good watchdog. Maybe you disagree. I think the Guardian still speaks truth to power. They try to. Um, uh, but, you know, I mean, the way in which News Corp is just chipping away at the independence of the BBC and chipping away at their license fees because, God forbid, anybody should compete with Rupert Murdoch. Mm. Uh, it's, just, it's just disgraceful. Um, in terms of uh, some of Mark's comments, Mark, citizens, of course, have a role to play because they are the eyes and the ears on the ground. 
and there are more of their eyes and more of their ears than they will ever be at a regulatory agency. But uh, Bert Eli, who uh, came up with the P Eli Petrie model for uh, ensuring against bank failure, described uh, depositor protection, for example, he used the example of depositor protection. He said it's as effective as expecting patients to commit to uh, operating on themselves. And the fact of the matter is, and this is, this is part of the malaise that I see taking place in the United States, this belief that government at all levels just kill it. Part of what the financial industry does is simply too complex and simply too sophisticated for ordinary consumers to understand. Okay. And uh, we need regulatory agencies that will marshal the law, that will marshal uh, litigation specialists, and that will go after miscreants in the, in the financial industry. And it's not impossible. We have a very effective regulator in Australia in the form of the ACCC. Might not be perfect, but it is universally regarded as an exceptionally good regulator. But they've had exceptionally good leadership from the time of Alan Fells to Graham Samuel to uh, Rod Sims. So uh, I take your point, Mark, that, that, that consumers have a vital role to play, but government's got to step up. I mean, that's why we live in a society with government. It's why we don't live in a state of nature. That's why we don't hopefully lead lives that are, as, uh, as Adam Smith described them, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Well, anyway, that's, that's all I have to say. Thank you, Andy, for the opportunity. Thank you, Andy, for your input. Wow, this has turned out to be a particularly thought-provoking session. It really has. You know what? I admit to have not ever given a thought to the media dimension that Pauline mentioned that you just spoke about right now. This is a bigger problem than, than we realise. Thank you, Andy. Thank you very, very much. Jeff Hauser, you have the final comment, sir. Over to you. Uh, thanks, Andy, for organising this event and all the uh, speakers and questioners. Um, I just want to end with the idea that this should be thought of in a probabilistic matter. What is likely to make government better? Not does anyone have a single solution that will solve all the problems? Because we at the Revolving Door Project certainly don't believe that any of our ideas will guarantee a highly competent uh, government that is always fully aligned with the broader public interest. What we are hoping to do is increase the odds of outcomes that reflect the longstanding small d democratic majorities that exist that if there are longstanding laws on the books, be they 19th century antitrust laws or 20th century fair housing laws or 21st century financial services regulation, that they are all enforced uh, vigorously by the government. And so um, to what Andy was saying earlier, it's not that um, civil servants are inevitably competent or uh, will do the right thing. We are about creating restrictions on behavior and pressures on the selection of key figures that increases the odds of a positive outcome. And I think that's, you know, within the fallen world in which we all exist, the best we can hope for is things that may be necessary but are not sufficient to uh, make government better. Well, wow, you've, uh, you've managed to end us on a very, very pragmatic and a very positive and hopeful note, Jeff. That's really great. Really lovely way to end the session. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. Particular thanks, of course, to Jeff and to Mark Bishop and to Andy Shmulo and for Sabrina and her colleagues who facilitated the session earlier today. Uh, a really, really thought-provoking event. This won't be the last one we'd run on Revolving Door. May I take the opportunity to thank you all very much indeed for coming along, for being part of it and for sharing your thoughts when you had the chance to do so. Thank you very much. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.